Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, here to talk with you today about a very specific kind of argument, one that was recently advanced by an author friend of mine, or at least I like to think of them as a friend, Paul Tassi at Forbes, and it's a thesis with which I fervently disagree. What is that thesis? Well, you can see it on your screen right now if you're watching, or I'll read it to you if you're listening. Outriders World Slayer, comma, and the perils of not being a live service in 2022. Now, Outriders World Slayer, we're going to talk about what that is. It's an expansion to a video game that was maybe moderately successful, question mark, question mark, question mark. But what I'm really focused on is this notion of whether there are perils of not being a live service game in this year. If you are familiar with the concept, then you already know that video games that continue to update, that change either their world state or their content or their narrative story or what have you, are considered live services. They're always on, they're always changing, and they are making a lot of companies a lot of money. This is Fortnite, this is Destiny 2, this is Apex Legends. These are games that evolve as you play but also tend to be a smaller entry fee to actually get your foot in the door. Destiny 2 is maybe a bad example of that. They're ostensibly free to play, but you basically have to pay it for admission on almost every angle. Fortnite, Apex Legends, very much the opposite of that. But live service games, while popular, are still relatively new in terms of dominating the video game landscape. They make their makers billions if they are successful, and that's why you see them so oftenly sold into the marketplace for video games. But I would offer, not every game has to be a live service. And I doubt that very many people would disagree with that concept, but Outriders World Slayer is an interesting place to talk about it. And that's what Paul chooses to do today. So this isn't a legal focused virtual legality episode. This is a business focused virtual legality episode. And it's talking about topics that I like to talk about. And I have talked about a lot, if you're interested, on the BitCast every Sunday with my friends at Season Gaming. We talk about this a lot because this guy here in the bottom left corner, Ty Guy Travis, reviewer at IGN, feels very adamantly that live service games are great, as does Paul Tassi here, right? And for the record, while I think Paul is wrong about his thesis here, I'm not sure how committed he is to it. We'll talk about why I think that uh, as well. And first and foremost, I don't want to drag him. I'm not slamming him. Reasonable minds can differ on these kinds of things. I just think he's wrong. And I'm going to talk about why. So, in this article he put out today, a month and a half ago, Outriders debuted its World Slayer expansion, a $40 content drop that echoed the days of Diablo 2's Lord of Destruction, including new loot, powers, story, and endgame, in what was the game's first truly major content update since its release in April of 2021, over a year earlier. So to set the stage here, if you don't play video games, for the most part, games are updated pretty constantly now with smaller DLC than stuff that's sold at $40 a pop. Now, that's not all of them. We'll talk about that as well as to why there are, I think there are issues with this particular metaphor. Uh, but in the old days, you used to get a CD of Diablo 2, as is the example here. And later on, there would be a whole new act added to that game with another CD you would purchase for a considerable amount of money and you would get another character and some more content. So what Paul is saying here at Forbes is that this, Outriders, looks a lot like that. And I don't think he's wrong on that score because Outriders and People Can Fly, the company that makes this game, has been very vocal about the fact that they want their game to feel like it is complete in the way that games used to feel complete. Or as Paul puts it, but while Outriders has been extremely vocal about not wanting to be a live service and to fall down that rabbit hole, it may actually be a good example of how hard it is to compete without being one in this day and age. So Paul advances his thesis here, which is to say it is difficult to compete in the world of video games and keeping folks' attention if you aren't having some kind of live service component in your video game. And we've seen certain long-standing brands adopt live service components. Most recently, I believe, would be the Halo franchise and Halo Infinite that has turned itself into a quasi live service game. And we'll see if that actually plays out for them. But I do want to go back just in time a little bit to talk about how People Can Fly was talking about their game. They say, we're launching with a full game that you can enjoy with everything there. That was the plan four years ago, and those are decisions and directions we're sticking to. As for the complete package, it's just one aspect. Games are really expensive, and we want players to have everything for the price at launch. 
we are feeling we can create a huge universe, a big universe that we're going to at one point expand, which they did in this update in April. For now, we are focused on delivering what we're proposing. We're delivering a full package with a full game, full story. It's a very important IP for us, but also for Square Enix. So this was their marketing at bare minimum, but also seems to be their guiding philosophy that live service games are not necessarily all that and all that the video game industry can be. And I like to think that they are right. Now, I'm a proponent just in terms of both being a game player and an entrepreneur and a business lawyer in having variety out there that I think the market definitely enjoys having different choices of ways to experience things like video games and certainly every other thing that you can imagine. So I look at this and say, great, they're going to do it this way. And that will be different than the way that others are doing it. And that's a worthwhile endeavor for them to pursue. But Paul says this made it more difficult for them. And while I think he's wrong overall, it's going to take a little bit of digging to figure out why. First of all, I think Paul's playing fast and loose a little bit with whether or not Outriders is a live service game, right? So he says it's so hard to not be a live service game. Here is why. If you go back to the release of World Slayer in this particular instance, he actually has a headline article at its release that says Outriders and when not a live service game is a live service game. So here he is saying that Outriders is in fact a live service game because they are adopting this Lord of Destruction model when he's now in this article saying that that's in fact the opposite of being a live service game. Now, people can change their minds. And I think to some extent he's operating on a gotcha basis here with People Can Fly and Outriders. I don't really have a problem with that, but it's worth pointing out when you have these kinds of conversations with folks, and this is a bit of a headlines kind of argument, that they can change their definitions on you if you're not watching closely. So he says, the idea was to release a complete game at launch, even if it was a looter like Destiny or Anthem or fellow Square Enix title Marvel's Avengers. But now that the game is here, the line between what is or isn't a live service game is getting pretty blurry. If you ask people can fly the developers, they would probably say that since Outriders does not have roadmaps, seasons, battle passes, or microtransactions, that means it's not a live service game. They aren't otherwise trying to monetize your engagement with the product, which I would put forward is the most important definition of how a publisher thinks about the product that it has put into the market. Are we monetizing engagement? Because if we aren't, we care about selling you products. We care about getting good reviews to sell you the next product, but we don't actually care that much about how long or how long the tail is for your engagement with the product that we sold you. That is distinct from say Fortnite or Apex Legends where we're not actually asking for a cover charge here. We need you to constantly have eyes on the game and eyes on our store. That to me is the distinction between what people think of as live services and not from the publisher's perspective where the publisher looks at something like Outriders says, hey, we sell it for 60, then we sell it for 40. That's not a live service game to us because everything else that we're doing in the interim is trying to make that product good enough for you to want to buy it and then buy our next product or next expansion, but not to actively keep you engaged with the product as it stands today. Now, Paul offers in this earlier April article, if you ask players, they would probably say that the game is the very definition of live, given that you need to always be online, which is important, even to play solo, and that has worked to the game's detriment with technical launch issues. Similarly, players believe that a game that is constantly throwing out balance patches for builds and endgame activities is a very live service thing to do. I don't think that holds water at all, right? If you go and look at something like Horizon Forbidden West, you will see a ton of balance patches and changes and other things that are designed to improve the product, to sell through to more people, and to otherwise make their goodwill rise with the level of what they're putting out there in the market. That's not live services. That's just customer service. Uh, and those are distinct, and I don't think that makes the case for Paul here. Now, he does say it's a spectrum. On the far end, you have games like Destiny and Genshin Impact, true live service games with constantly new content releases, large and small, with ongoing events and reasons to log in and play every day. Do them dailies, in other words. Sliding down the scale, you have games that wanted to be that type of game, Avengers and Anthem, but were unable to keep up with the demands of that volume of content. Avengers is still releasing free updates and having events, just not at the same pace. And if you go all the way to the other end, you have complete games like God of War, where the most extended gameplay you do there is maybe a new game plus run, no multiplayer, no real reason to keep playing after you beat it. Outriders, he posits, is somewhere in between those last two categories, and I would put it somewhat close to Borderlands 3, a game that also declared it was not a live service game, mostly due to no seasons or microtransactions, but ultimately released a lot of DLC. Now, there's no proof that Outriders will release a lot of DLC, but you can see what Paul's getting at, and it's this concept 
that live service and not live service is not a binary proposition. It is somewhere in the middle. Now, from the publisher's perspective, I think you are concepting out your business plan by whether or not you are going to try to monetize engagement or not. That is the fundamental definitional question. But I tend to agree with Paul that there is a spectrum. Ghost of Tsushima, which I think should be nestled right up against God of War here, but they do have their multiplayer addition to that game. Cyberpunk 2077, I don't know why you would believe it's a live service at all at this point in time. Then he has Outriders, and then you have all this stuff on the end. So as of April, Paul Tassi of Forbes is positing that it is a spectrum. By the time we roll in to August of 2022, he's saying that because Outriders finds itself over here, it just can't compete with this stuff over here. And as I said at the top of this video, I made this video in order to disagree with this overall thesis. Now, why? Let's read a little bit further. I ended up liking World Slayer quite a bit. This is important. Paul likes this product. To me, it had almost everything I hoped for from an Outriders expansion, including a new campaign, tons of new gear to chase, a revamped difficulty system, and a fun new endgame pursuit, The Trials of Tarya Gritar. However, it is a one-off release, and after a certain amount of grinding, you feel like you're just sort of done. And it appears people are feeling that way on Moss. So, he then brings up this picture. Again, this is the first major content update to the game since release, and it took a year to get here. But now that it's arrived, after spiking Outrider's player count a month and a half later, it's back to essentially exactly where it was before the expansion. Now, Paul is treating this as if this is some kind of revelation or discovery. We can go and we can look at the Outrider's chart a little bit more fulsomely here, and we can see that Paul's right. We look at the last six months, it's down here at about 1,300, 2,400 concurrent, 2,000 concurrent, etc., and it pops up here when they release World Slayer. And it gets up to 12,000 or so. You're going to want to keep these numbers in mind because they are fundamental to disproving Paul Tassi of Forbes' thesis here. He's right that after this pops, in a couple of months, people get done with it and they go back down to whoever's currently playing it uh, with a baseline of 125,000 at the all-time peak sold through, give or take. That kind of gives you the notion of what these numbers look like. And he is saying... This is either unusual or it's natural for something that uses this expansion framework and it's not going to get the job done for the publishers. I would tend to agree that Outriders overall, as it presently stands, is not going to get the job done for People Can Fly or Square Enix. But I would also posit that that's not because of this model, which I would say we can see in every other instance of live service games, including, but because of this that this number is low enough. And we're only using the Steam players here, and there's obviously going to be players on consoles, and we don't know where most people are playing these games, etc. But just as a theoretical construct here, it's this number that results in this number, right? That your sell-through is going to result in this lower number, and your model doesn't determine where you wind up here. It's your product. So if we look at something, for instance, like Destiny, what he describes as the quintessential live services game, right? We see all here. This is the entire history of Destiny, at least on this chart, goes back about three years. And we can see it has pops, right? Goes down to 100,000, 76,000 or so, pops up, goes back down, pops up, goes back down, goes back down, pops up a little bit. And then we have something like Witch Queen here, where it pops way up and then goes back down. So... It's not that unusual, I think it's probably intuitive to us all, that when a game releases new content that people want to play, it pops up. And then people eventually play through whatever level of that content they wanted to play through, and it goes back down. What's the primary difference here? The difference is that this is the number you're playing with instead of 1,500. You got 62,000 people in the last 24 hours playing Destiny 2, even though that doesn't match their 289,000 from when they released Witch Queen, it's still something that you can work with. Similarly, we look at something that is also a quintessential kind of live services game, Apex Legends, right? And why does it win? Well, it just released a big content upgrade. It was at 343 as of August 8th. It's at 510. That is a massive jump, but we can already see it coming down a little bit. It's already 60,000 down in the last week, and we would expect it to return to the already heady spaces of 300,000 concurrent players. But why is that occurring? It's because of the underlying product, right? All right, let's keep reading from Paul. The problem 
is that everyone can say that they do not want so many live games and seasonal models and microtransactions, but there is a reason that those exist. It is hard to keep attention on your game with so many other live games going on simultaneously. Now here we have to take a step back. Paul, love him. He loves live services games. They are his bread and butter. He's constantly playing them. I honestly don't know when he sleeps. And so he loves these things. He posits now that if you're just Outriders and you just play through it once, that you can't keep people's attention. But the question there might be, to what end would you keep people's attention, right? When you set your business model up to not care about engagement over time with your product, then you don't need to care about engagement over time with your product. You want people to have good thoughts about your product. Hey, I kind of enjoyed that Outriders. Hey, that World Slayer was a pretty good expansion. You want people to thinking those things when you sell the next expansion or when you sell Outriders too. And at least according to Paul, mission accomplished for Square Enix and people can fly on that. And they've already made the money they intended to make, budgeted for this project. Could you have made more being a live service game? Perhaps but it would have fundamentally changed both the way that your company is organized to deliver on those live services promises and probably how your game is designed. And that's what people miss. We don't need everything to be Destiny or Division or Apex or Fortnite or anything else that involves solely live services. You can have a broader design space with more needs fulfilled for more and varied people if you have those different designs that all can coexist. And I would argue that Outriders, while probably not a broad success, at least not with these kinds of Steam numbers, doesn't prove anything at all with respect to whether or not it could have been, right? When it releases its game, it sells 125,000 or so on Steam in the first instance. That's probably not high enough for what Square Enix and People Can Fly wanted to have happen. But that's about Outriders, which I also enjoy, like Paul does, not about the business model. Right? Because we can see this happen all over the place. What does a purely single player game look like? Right, We talked about this in his first article. He says God of War. So let's look at that. They have a 73,000 number on Steam. And God knows it's primarily thought of as a PlayStation exclusive. It's going to have different and much higher numbers over on that. But we can see at least in picture form what the trend line looks like for a game of God of War's type. No humps at all. It goes from this to this. But... Even at this level for a single player game, you still see 3,000 people playing it concurrently, which is higher than Outriders. That's the product, not the business model, because God of War has a completely different one. Furthermore, he talks about Marvel's Avengers, which wanted to be a live service game, but failed at it. Avengers has this problem even louder right? It only has 28,000 at its all-time peak. It goes down and down and down and down and down until it's showing 300, 400 people. It pops up here for the addition of some amount of content that I don't know of for Marvel's Avengers as of June 27, 2022, and then goes down and down and down and down. This would be the expected model. This is the Destiny model, except for Instead of having these numbers down here be 75,000, when you're talking about Marvel's Avengers, you're talking about 500. All of these models can work, all of them, but it matters what your underlying product is. And I personally would like to have the opportunity to purchase games that are quote unquote complete as long as I like them. So I think Paul is entirely wrong here because Paul is looking at this as some kind of zero sum game where Outriders is a failure because of its business model. When we can see successes in one business model and successes in another business model, and it always depends on what the game is. It's possible Outriders just didn't catch on or at least not with the Steam crew, even though I like Paul like that game. But he says you beat it, you grind until you burn out and then you shelve it indefinitely. And I would argue What's wrong with that? A lot of games can operate like that. He does wonder if it will be able to keep its current microtransaction-free standalone expansion formatting if the series does continue. And while he says he finds it refreshing in many ways, the numbers show just how hard retention is when you're using this model. Yes, retention doesn't stay, but you're not making your budget back on retention. I mean, if they can sustain it, I'm all for it, and I would show up for a second expansion a year from now and certainly a full sequel. So they've done their job with you, Paul. But Outriders does feel like a dying breed in many ways where just being good isn't enough to stand out and hold players' interest these days, barring generational miracles like Elden Ring. We'll have to see where this series goes from here. And before I leave you off here, I thought it would be useful because he uses the concept of a generational miracle like Elden Ring as proving his point 
is I would argue proving the exact opposite. If we look at Elden Ring's schedule here, we can see exactly what Elden Ring does. It looks exactly like God of War's schedule. The only difference is God of War starts at 73,000. Elden Ring starts at 952,000. It looks like this, but I have no doubt in my mind that From Software is perfectly happy with this happening right here, not the least of which is because even at this quote unquote low line number, it's at 40,000 concurrent people because its baseline starts up here. So even though it follows the same pattern, the product was so good, or at least so popular among people that like these various things that they were able to have this business model and I'd be willing to bet make a lot of money doing it. So yes, can games like this survive? Absolutely. Is Elden Ring a special case? Yes. But does that mean Elden Ring would have benefited from being a live service? No. And I would argue that if you force somebody like People Can Fly to make a game they don't want to make, like perhaps Crystal Dynamics was forced to make a Marvel's Avengers, you wind up with results like Marvel's Avengers, where you get the same problems, you get the little humps, but your number is so darn low, it probably would have been better for you just to God of War the darn thing. And even if you go down, you're still going to go down with a number that's higher than Avengers shows as concurrent at any time in its history. So Paul, I love you. I think it's an interesting article, but I think you're absolutely wrong. And I think all of these business models can survive. It just depends on what you put into the package itself. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy this kind of content, a discussion of business, law, video games, technology, software, and more, please consider supporting the channel. We can't do it without viewers and listeners like you. We've got a Utreon where more of the resources get to us. We've got a Patreon with which more of you may be familiar. If you don't like either of those options, just consider subscribing, telling your friends, ringing bells, upvotes, downvotes, all the rest. Every single little bit helps let YouTube know that you're here and that you're having fun watching this particular content. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Thank you.